and we'll start recording. Okay, sweet. So yeah, uh, everyone, please welcome Sharon, uh, Sharon and Jen. Great, thanks for the intro, Alan. Um, so as he mentioned, um, I'm Sharon, and I'm going to be presenting today with Jen. And before we get started, I just thought I would give a little outline for today's presentation. So today we'll start with a brief introduction of ourselves and how we chose OT, and then offer some background information on occupational therapy and discuss a little bit of what it's like to be a student OT and then end with a Q&A. So throughout the session, if you have any questions that come up, please feel free to put them in the chat box or send them to Alan if you don't wanna uh, put it out publicly. And then we'll be addressing all of the questions at the end. Okay. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Jen. Thanks for coming on your Saturday morning um, to learn a bit more about OT. So to give you all a bit of a background on myself, um, I'm a UBC kin grad. So I originally grew up in Toronto and moved out to Vancouver to do my kin degree at UBC. And then right now I'm a first year Masters of Occupational Therapy student. Um, so how I chose OT, uh, definitely a long story, but I'll give you guys the Sparks Notes version. Uh, so I grew up um, in athletics, and so I came to UBC and thought I wanted to do physiotherapy uh, because I had been on the client side um, from physio. And I did a lot of courses at UBC and did some co-op placements. And although I adore my uh, PT colleagues. I worked in a physio clinic. I realized it wasn't quite the right match for me. So I did some other work um, with adaptive recreation in Vancouver and worked with adults with developmental disabilities as a, a community and peer support worker. And I got to work alongside a few amazing OTs and just different community support workers. Um, so I really started to learn what actually OT was and realized it kind of aligned more so with what I was looking for out of a career. Um, and then I think just the final reason I really, really chose OT is because I think it's a beautiful blend of art and science in a way. So art being like the sort of humanistic creative side of things where you're trying to really get to know a person and, and figure out their world and what goals they have and how you can kind of creatively figure out how to do that. And then it's also that science side of things um, with a lot of research and um, more so those evidence-based interventions. So I thought it was kind of a mix of both worlds and um, I kind of finally made my decision to apply to OT and I'm really, really happy with that. Um, so to give, we thought we would give everyone a bit of background about some of our placements as well. So I did my first placement um, in inpatient, outpatient youth and uh, young adult mental health and substance use in Vancouver. So the uh, outpatient was through Foundry BC, which is a great resource for all young adults. Um, and then the inpatient was at the Hope Center. And my second placement is going to be in an outpatient neuro clinic. So that will be working with individuals with stroke or brain injuries. Um, and it's this one's a student led clinic with um, OTs and student PTs and speech language pathologists as well. So that just helps give everyone a bit of sense of what a placement might be uh, called. And I'll pass it on over to Sharon. Great, thanks. So I'm also a UBC kin grad a little bit further back though from 2015. And after I finished my kin grad, I also thought I might want to go into physio and I was unsure, but my grades weren't quite there yet. So I kind of had this weird gap year and then I was actually offered an opportunity to do a master's of rehab sciences, uh, which is uh, OT and PT based, but it's a thesis based. So you don't actually, you can't practice afterwards, but you get to contribute to the field of knowledge in OT, PT or rehab sciences is what they call it. So I did that with an OT focus in the area of wheelchair skills training in the community. And then from there, it kind of bleeds into how I chose OT because after my uh, doing that master's, I kind of got more exposed to what OTs did and it being a mixed method study. I did a lot of interviews with a lot of uh, participants and I just got to hear how much they loved their OT and how much of a difference they made in their lives. And it kind of made me reconsider my choices, um, thinking, reconsidering, like, why do I even want to do physio? Like just reflecting on that and kind of made me realize that a lot of my values end up going, 
<clears throat> we're more aligned with OT, just talking about how um, it's very client centered, doing the thing, helping people do the things they want to do. And I, at first I was more drawn to physio because I thought it would be more sciencey based, like more anatomy and physiology, but there's a ton of that in OT as well still. So my first placement was in mental health at BC Children's Hospital. Um, so I got to work in an inpatient psychiatry unit uh, for adolescents aged 12 to 18. And then I also worked in an outpatient ADHD clinic there during that time. Um, and my second placement is going to be in the community in Vancouver for people who are discharged from GF Strong, but still need some OT support still. So we'll visit them in their homes and continue to provide support, whether it's feeding and swallowing, helping them with wheelchair adjustments, making sure they're safe at home and so forth. Okay, so the big question, what is occupational therapy? Um, so we thought, thought to start off really to explain what occupational therapy is, you need to understand the word occupation. Um, so occupation is all the things that we do in our everyday life that occupies our time. So in OT jargon, this is broken down into kind of three big categories. So self-care occupations, which are all the things you need to do, um, things like eating, sleep, brushing your teeth, having a shower, those basic needs. And then we also look at all the things that people want to do in their everyday lives. So that's something they would do for fun or enjoyment. So that might look like um, your social participation, leisure, hobbies, things like that. And then we also look at productivity. So all the things people are more so expected to do um, in society, um, which would be like work or school or um, caregiving for parents or children. So it really expands uh, an enormous range of activities people do in their everyday lives. But the key thing is that we focus in on what matters to the person. So what is meaningful and important to them is sort of the scope that we work in, um, in terms of the occupations we support them in doing. And then therapy is that act of helping someone return to a state of optimal functioning. So, um, with occupational therapy, what we'll do is we'll meet a client and we'll figure out what their goals are in relation to what matters to them in their world. And we'll help them do that um, in a variety of different ways. OTs usually take a sort of top down or functional approach. So instead of looking at a body level, um, we really look at an activity level. So, you know, a diagnosis isn't as important as what someone can and can't do in their everyday lives. So we'll take that really big top down approach um, when looking at a client that we work with. And we're all about focusing on function. So getting them back to doing um, the things in their everyday life that matter. And OTs generally take a very holistic approach. So we consider sort of the mind, um, that mental health aspect, physical and spiritual. Um, so it's much more broad than um, a physio would be focusing more on the body and body mechanics. Um, and I think a nice example to highlight sort of the role of occupation in people's lives right now is considering how COVID has sort of been this big change for most uh, folks who suddenly are no longer able to do the things that they want to do um, because of COVID. And we can see just how quickly that's impacted um, everyone as a whole. So things like people's mental health, their physical health, um, rates of overdoses. So we know that not being able to do the things that matter in our lives really has a huge impact on our overall health. So that's kind of where an OT would come in. And we put this diagram here, the PEO model. So that's kind of the lens in a very simple form that an OT would take. So they would consider the person, um, what, they, what their skills are, what they can and can't do, um, the environments that they live in, and um, the occupation, so the activities they do in their lives and sort of see the intersection of the three of those things and try to work with them with that perspective. I'll pass it on to Sharon, who's going to um, sort of differentiate this between physiotherapy because OTs and PTs commonly work side by side. Yeah, so Jen nicely put what occupational therapy is, but what is not occupational therapy. So a common question we get is, so are you guys just like physios? And the answer is no. Um, so physios often focus on addressing physical impairments 
whereas we are more function focused. So for example, if someone broke their leg, uh, a physio would look at helping the leg heal and helping their re helping with movement to reinstall movement uh, in that person. Whereas a physio would help the individual be able to function in their everyday life still. So that means they can go home, they can go back to work, and then they can go back to caring for their kids if they have kids. And the means they do to do that might be using assistive technologies. So things such as a walker or a crutches or things like prescribing a wheelchair for the short term. Um, they might need to help them make some modifications in their environment um, or modifications to the things that they wanna do. So looking again at that PEO model. Um, so while physios work mainly with people struggling with physical impairments, OTs work with a variety of impairments, whether it be physical, mental, or social. And physios and OTs often work together, but OTs often work with other professionals as well, such as social workers, speech language pathologists, psychiatrists, and so forth. And so, um, so we also get, have the opportunity to work with a wide range of healthcare professionals. And it's just important to remember that as OTs, we just have function at the forefront of our mind and everything we do, it's to help enable function. While other people such as psychiatrists might help to cure or heal the mind and social workers might be relating um, people to other um, pockets of um, resources that are available in the community. And there might be some overlap there, but we just remember that we focus on function. So we um, thought we would give a breakdown of what the process might actually look like when you're working with clients. Um, so the big picture goal that um, Sharon mentioned was function. So enhancing participation in daily activities that are meaningful to clients. And so what we would start off with generally um, would be a phase of interview and assessment. So we would meet with the person and really, really get to know them, who they are inside and out as a, as a whole person, and then do some assessments to see um, either from a top-down approach, how they're functioning um, in their home or community or even the hospital setting, and then look at some specific skills that might be a challenge for that person specifically. So once we get kind of a baseline of assessments and really build rapport with that person, then we would move on to sort of an intervention phase. And generally OT interventions take two big umbrella approaches. So one would be a remedial approach. So that's when you're trying to improve the skill itself. Um, so for example, if an individual has a stroke, a remedial approach would be reteaching them how to move their hands so that they can eat a meal independently. So it would be regaining a skill in some capacity. And then we also take a compensatory approach. So that would be for um, parts of the body or areas that can't be changed that easily. Um, we would try to figure out a new way to do that. So that might be through equipment, like Sharon mentioned, or modifications to their environment, their home, um, the tools that they're using to do their activities, whatever it might be for the individual. So it kind of falls under those two big umbrella terms. But Aside from working with clients, OTs do a lot of other uh, things within their role. So, I mean, like many other professionals, um, a lot of your time is spent charting, um, documenting what you're doing with clients. Uh, they spend a lot of time teaching students, either as um, clinical professors who come back into the classroom to teach us, or as preceptors who take on students on placement. Um, OTs do a lot of research. Um, with a variety of different other health professionals. And then we'll do a lot of discharge planning. So that would be making the final decision if someone is safe to go home and that they have everything they need. And then they might spend some time doing follow-up in the community or um, if they're transferring a client from a hospital-based OT, for example, to a community-based OT, checking up on that client and following along to make sure that they have everything they need um, and are well supported. So that's just a general overview of the kind of flow of the process um, from first meeting a client to when you would discharge and, and not see them anymore. So what kind of work uh, do OTs do? So to start, our clients can be a lot of different groups. They could be an individual, like a person. They could be a family. It could be an organization, like working for a business. And it's, so it doesn't have to be just one person all the time. And there are different areas that OT work, uh, OTs work in, and 
some of them include mental health. So across in mental health work, we would help people across the lifespan, so kids, adults, and geriatrics. And some diagnoses that you would see include substance use and addiction, depression, schizophrenia, and Alzheimer's. Another area is working in acute or an inpatient setting. And this is in pretty much every department in a hospital that you would see. So there's ortho, the ER, post-surgery, um, and so on for that. Um, and then in the rehab setting, uh, it's a lot of neuro uh, rehab. So things like stroke, brain injury, spinal cord injury, and so forth. And OTs also work with companies, so working with everyday staff, and this might look like working with um, ergonomics and helping them with adapt their workplaces to make them more accessible, in addition to working with marginalized populations. So what do we do? Uh, we've said it quite a bit. As a reminder, function is the primary purpose of our work. And some of the things we actually do are, as you can see on the screen, things like prescribing assistive devices. So wheelchairs, bathroom equipments like raised toilet seats and the shower tub or sh shower seat and then walkers. We also do wheelchair seating clinics. So people who need to use a wheelchair for a longer duration of time will customize their wheelchair so that they don't get any pressure sores and that they can be functional in their wheelchair as well. Uh, making sure clients can live safely at home. So if you've had a brain injury and you might not be able to safely use the stove or cook for yourself, uh, we'll go and assess you and then figure out what, how we can help you live safely at home by yourself. Um, when in a pediatric setting, helping kids be focused and be productive at school. So particularly if they have um, ADHD, for example, and have a hard time focusing and sitting still, we have some sensory and other techniques we can use to help with them. Um, in the domain of pediatrics, there's also early intervention, mostly for children on the autism spectrum, uh, where this can, we can help teach kids to uh, concepts of being inclusive, uh, teaching them how to play and socialization a bit. So teaching them how to wait in line, for example, or teaching them that they can't always get what they want. Um, in the mental health area, it's a lot of, uh, we do cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, group therapy, in addition to other types of one-on-one -on -one sessions. There's hand therapy, so splinting, um, mostly splinting, creating custom splints for hands and fingers and up to the shoulder even. Uh, I mentioned ergonomics and workplace health. If uh, you want, you can also go into policy and program development, a big part of the OT role is advocacy. So speaking up and trying to get funding and trying to make change in the community. There's also driver rehab. So after having a substantial injury, you might need to be, uh, go undergo another ICBC test. So kind of teaching you how to drive again, adapting a car with different assistive tech and more. So you can see like a big draw to OT is that it's very diverse and you probably won't get tired of your job because if you do, you can switch areas and then it's a completely different job. And what the OT program strives to do is to give you a good baseline and teach you the theories of OT so that you can apply them in a bunch of different settings, which makes the job transferable a little bit between different areas. So we thought we would give um, you all just two different cases to just paint the picture a little bit about what OT might look like for a specific client. So um, I'll be going through the mental health case and then uh, Sharon will go through the physical health. So um, if our client whose name is Henry, he is 31 years old and has a diagnosis of schizophrenia. So when working with Henry, we would again, build that rapport, really get to know him. Um, and through that intervention or the assessment phase, he identifies that he needs assistance with IADLs, which means instrumental activities of daily living. So that would be things like grocery shopping, money management, um, something you don't need to do every day, but you really do need to do to you know, take care of yourself and your home. And he struggles with motivation, which is a common negative symptom of schizophrenia. Um, so a really low motivation or um, challenges with social situations. And his goal is that he wants to be able to live on his own. 
So um, what our OT intervention would look like would be breaking down that big goal of wanting to live on his own and figuring out those smaller uh, steps we need to take in order for Henry to get there. So we might help him find work um, through a place and train program, which means you go into a job setting first and then get trained on the job. Um, and we might visit Henry at his workplace, um, practice the skills we've been working on together in the actual environment he's going to be working. We might teach him some coping mechanisms, so some cognitive behavioral therapy um, to cope with the symptoms of schizophrenia and keep carrying on despite um, having a mental illness. Um, and then we will make sure he can live safely alone and has all the skills he needs to do that. And then lastly, we would work again with a social worker and try to help him find and sustain housing. But overall, um, what our sessions would look like with Henry would really be directed on him. We don't come in setting the agenda, um, our clients do. So we would really focus in on, you know, what does Henry want out of his, his life and um, how are we gonna help him get to that point? So that's just a bit of an overview of a mental health uh, case. Um, and then over on to the physical health kind of case. Um, so we have this case of Jill, who's a 45 year old woman who just had a stroke and she's in rehabilitation right now, uh, inpatient rehab. And so some of the occupational issues that she faces right now is she needs help with dressing herself, using the toilet and feeding herself. Uh, she has unilateral neglect, meaning she, can, she doesn't pay attention to things on one side of, on the left side and has concerns with some executive functioning. Um, so things such as like planning, memory, initiating uh, movements and so forth. And her goal is to return home as soon as possible. So some things that a acute or an inpatient rehab OT would do with her are looking at adaptations for cooking and dressing. So for example, you can use a dressing stick or a sock aid to help put on socks uh, for people with stroke. In addition to cooking adaptations, so things such as if you're in a wheelchair, there are cooking knobs and kind of readjusting your kitchen um, to make it more accessible. Uh, we might use some metacognitive strategies for memory and motor relearning. So kind of things such as uh, using a planner or a photo book to help her with her memory issues and helping her plan out her days. In addition to motor relearning, so kind of strategies such as uh, real thinking about your movements and thinking really kind of understanding and thinking about where your deficits are in your movement so you can try to work on it better and have that awareness. Uh, we can also do things such as visual scanning training for neglect. So if you can, if you're kind of neglecting things on one side of your visual field, uh, placing things on the neglected side to encourage them to use that side more. Uh, there's also some techniques such as putting bright colored tape. So people are learning to read from the colored tape and onwards. And then also discharge planning. So talking with the client about what it would look like to go home for them and what some issues they might face when they go home are. Um, unfortunately, as an inpatient, uh, inpatient rehab um, OT, you don't actually normally go into people's homes, but that gets into more of a community OT uh, kind of job. Okay, and then um, the last slide before we sort of transition into questions phase was just looking at what is it like being an OT student? Yeah, so to start off, it is a two year full time program at UBC at least and at UBC we get a month of vacation so we actually get that at the end of your first year in August, and then you get holidays off so around the Christmas time, uh, we get a, a week or two of break there. Uh, there's a total of five placements we do. Uh, before COVID, there was two, a requirement of two out-of-town or rural uh, placements, which are essentially anything out of Vancouver Coastal Health. So you could go to Surrey and do a placement. Or, you know, we have colleagues going up north to like Burns Lake or Vanderhoof, uh, way up there, Kitimat, um, to do their rural placements. And then on top of the, uh, but because of COVID, we only currently have to do one out-of-town or rural placement. Uh, we all have to do one mental health placement. So you could see Jen and I both had our first um, and only probably mental health placement already. And then one acute placement. So that's usually hospital based. And also our class schedule is pretty variable. So it's not like undergrad where you sign up for classes and every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at one, you have a class. 
classes actually change every day, week to week, but it's so that the program can fit in guest speakers and accommodate for longer lectures and labs um, that we might need. But in general, classes start around nine or 10 and end around three or four every day. And it's pretty flexible. But I'll let Jen get into that a little bit more. Yeah, so um, I think we wouldn't be in an OT program unless there was a priority a bit from our professors about how to balance school, work, personal life. So um, yeah, you definitely can balance the three of those. Um, both Sharon and myself have a part-time job um, while we're in school and have time to see family and friends. Right now, we're in a pretty busy phase of school, I'll have to admit, so um, maybe that's a bit on the back burner, but overall as a whole, um, I would say that there's a good balance between the three, and um, we really value that our professors um, really care about that too for us and want to check in with our mental health and um, you know make sure we can take care of ourselves too. So that's really important. Um, and then we have a mix of self-directed learning, small group learning, case studies, and lecture. Um, so the self-directed learning would be sort of preparing some resources beforehand um, and then discussing them as a group in class. Um, we do tutorials every week where we go over different cases with a clinical OT as you know our mentor to help us work through those clinical cases. And then we do a lot of lectures, a mix of sort of your traditional lecture style, but the majority being really hands-on, um, actually practicing the skills, using the equipment on ourselves, um, practicing you know, lifts and transfers, like handling the wheelchairs ourselves because uh, you can't really do OT without doing it hands-on. And then we also have a bit of research involved in the mix too. So everyone does a capstone project that starts um, right about now for us. So kind of through your first year and then ends right about in graduation. And we have a big capstone pro um, conference at the end. And usually most students go on to publish their work. Um, so you have a supervisor from, sorry, my phone's going off. Uh, you have a supervisor from the community as a clinical OT as well as a professor. Um, or a researcher who works with you, and then you work in student groups of two. So it'll be a group of four in total. So that's just a bit of a breakdown about uh, you know, the student life. We attach some resources here um, just for everyone to refer back to, a mix of um, some podcasts that are by OTs that give a good picture of you know, where OTs work and what that might look like in different settings. Um, a couple Instagrams, books and blogs that um, I or myself have found helpful and I've just sort of shared on with people that are interested in applying to the program. I personally listened to a lot of podcasts before my interview, it just helped me prepare. So um, if you are interested, you can take a look at those. And then um, I'll pass it on to Sharon and we'll start with the <laughs> Q&A phase. Yeah, so this is the end and it's time for some questions. You can feel free to ask us anything about what we just talked about or other things such as like the application process, our experiences in OT school and so on. And we've also provided some suggestions, some questions if you don't have any questions. Um, but yeah, I think we'll open up the floor at this time. Yeah, so if anybody has a question for the two presenters, you guys can feel free to just uh open up your mic and speak, or um, you can put it in the chat as well. I actually have a, uh, two questions myself. Um, so the first one, I was just wondering how you think the workload compares to like, um, like a typical undergraduate student in kin. And then the second one is like, if you were to give like an advice to someone trying to pursue OT who is currently undergrad student, what would the advice be? Okay, um, <laughs> you want me to take on the first one for Ken and then you can take sure. it? Yeah. Um, workload, I would say it is, it really depends on what Ken classes you're taking, but I think it would be um, slightly more in the sense that it's just more consistent. I almost view school as like my full-time job where I go to school all day. Um, you know, my whole day is, is full of labs and hands-on stuff. And then I try to keep my nights and weekends for me. Um, so I guess there's less like open free time randomly throughout the week, but um, yeah, so probably actually is about equivalent, but most students are 
really, really um, keen to help support each other. So we kind of try to put all our brains together, share resources, share notes so we can um, manage all of that. So yeah, I would say it would be um, about the same. For some people who are um, have been out of school for a bit longer, um, I know a lot of our peers mentioned that it was a bit of an adjustment coming back into school, but um, I think coming straight out of an undergrad, it, it felt pretty similar for me. And we don't have that intense exam period. Um, our, any exams we have are kind of scattered through the semester, so there really isn't that stressful midterm or exam period. It's kind of really consistently um, spread out. I would say. Yeah, and I was going to say a lot of our, our coursework is not memorization based. So there's really no pressure to just memorize and cram things. A lot of our exams are either open book or application based. So you have to apply your knowledge to a case study or you have to go in and demonstrate something on a case study. So and as Jen mentioned, all the exams are spread out throughout the term and the profs purposely do this so that there's no final period. There's no heavy rush of a exam period really is just scattered throughout which is really nice for the scheduling mm -hmm. that's good thank you because i know that like i was talking to some pt students they're saying how like their schedule is so hectic and like they're it's quite a bit different than pt <laughs> we've learned <laughs> I didn't, I didn't realize that until like now but yeah thank you guys mm -hmm. um i think the first question um would be what are some of your best interview tips that you can provide for students um, I'm going to say I spent a lot of time thinking <laughs> beforehand. Um, I think just reflecting on really why you want to be an OT, um, what that means to you and just sort of, if it means writing or talking it out, really like thinking and coming up with an answer. Um, and then I think a, something that was helpful for me was trying to really connect what I had done um, to how that relates to occupational therapy and really just get to know the practice, um, meaning like what are current, you know, issues in the practice, what are current like areas where OTs are working in um, and want to work in, but really most experiences in some capacity can be connected back to OT, whether you're a teacher and you're not explicitly working in a rehab setting, you know, as an OT, you still teach people skills. So I think, yeah, trying to think about how your experiences relate to the profession and um, just hone in on why you want to, to, to join the profession. Right. Yeah, as Jen noted, I would also emphasize the whole self-reflection piece and really know what OT means to you, how you would define OT and why you want to do OT. But on top of that, just think, reflectively like I spend a lot of time um, I'm sure you guys all take the cast know of the Casper there's a Casper exam that you take um, for both physio OT and med school now um, but kind of similar to the, the way I prepped for that was just similar in the sense where I thought about what are times I was a leader what are ways that I showed critical thinking what's the time I had to solve uh, a conflict and those kind of basic questions that you want to reflect on as well but then also relate them back to OT life Mm -hmm. Yeah, that reminds me, I think the Casper, that prep period and like practicing coming up with an answer really succinctly and being able to like present it pretty quickly um, was a huge help. Um, I went back to a lot of the Casper questions when I was preparing for the actual like in-person interview and instead of written, they were just verbal this time. Yeah. Sweet. I hope that addresses your question, Abby. If you have any more questions, you can uh, um, continue on the chat. Um, the second question is, um, can you guys give a day in the life of your placement? Sure. Do you want to go first with yours, sir? Sure. So mine was at Children's Hospital. So my hours actually varied just because I had two preceptors. Uh -huh. So you can either have one preceptor and where you're working one on one, or you might get um, designated to two preceptors. And it's a lot of the times it's because OTs only work part time in an OT setting. Uh, so that was the case with mine. My ADHD clinic OT ran uh, worked three days a week, where my other preceptor in the inpatient psychiatry worked oh, four days a week. So uh, in a typical day, I would get there around 830. And right in the morning, there would be rounds. So you, during rounds, I normally just sat in. Um, the nursing, the nurses did all the report, main, main reporting at rounds. So I didn't have to report too much, but I know if OTs do report at rounds, that would be your time to report on your client. 
and in, in rounds, it's like the whole healthcare team. So you have the doctors, the nurses, social workers, anyone else. We, I was also in a mental health team. So that's why there is a psychiatrist and psychologist and a counselor in there as well. Um, and then after rounds, we would do a group session. Uh, so get all the kids together. We got to round them up, see, figure out who's coming and then kind of prepare for the group and then do the group. And then in the afternoon, we would do one-on-one -on -one sessions with the kids um, in terms of doing things like CBT-based sessions. And then um, after that, after each time we saw a kid though, there would be a lot of paperwork to go with them. So we would have to do a lot of charting, um, documenting what you did with them and what progress you've made and what, what, what you've done. And that was pretty much the end of the day already. Um, and so placement, your first placement is actually for five weeks, four days a week, which is nice because you get that one day off to kind of reflect. And then after that, there's um, a, two six-week placements and two seven-week placements that are five days long. And we also have this app called T-Res that we use for placements. And in the app, you actually have to enter every single encounter you have with clients you see. So, you know, today I saw this client, this is their diagnosis, this is what I did with them, um, how much independence or supervision you received with doing, uh, working with them. And then that way you can actually track and see all the clients you've ever worked with. And it's kind of goes into your resume for when you are applying for jobs. Um, and then on top of that, we, um, just for the first placement, we had to do weekly reflections about um, our placements as well. Yeah. Um, I could do my community-based one just to give kind of the opposite comparison. So I was also in a mental health placement. Um, so I was a community-based at a foundry in the North Shore. So a typical day would be um, I would come in. There weren't big rounds like there is in the hospital, but I would usually check in with my preceptor, um, the psychiatrist, and um, the peer support workers or um, counselors. And then we would do a mix of in-person sessions at um, the center, as well as home sessions or sessions in the community and sessions on Zoom because of COVID. Um, the majority of the populations we worked at with were youth and young adults with depression, um, anxiety, um, bipolar disorder or other mental illnesses and comorbid substance use. Um, so a lot of the goals would be around getting employment or um, helping people get back to slowly doing more and more activity if they're in a really um, large depressive episode. And then other things like medication management or other goals that they had are, that are more specific to them. So it was a big mix of uh, community in person and Zoom. And we would kind of do an hour, an hour and a half session and then a break and document. And sometimes I would join in on groups with the peer support workers. Um, peer support workers are individuals with lived experience. And in that setting, they worked right alongside the OT as a team. Um, so I would do a lot of sessions with them as well um, with larger groups. So yeah, that was a little bit breakdown of my day. Sweet, thank you guys. Um, we have another question that was just asking, how has your kin degree helped you with uh, the Masters of OT program? Um, do you want to, um, Sharon, do you want to go first and then I can do, um, you've also done that matters too as well. Yeah, mine is a little further out, um, though, but I was, I would say like, it definitely helps with the anatomy section. Um, it's interestingly, our class is split, um, like the, from undergrad wise about maybe a third of our class actually came from arts with the psychology background um, so that's more of the mental health area and about a third or maybe a little bit more comes from a kin some sort of kin background and a third I would say is like other um, I don't know Dan if you would agree on that split. That's, that's right. it's a pretty diverse class so it's not necessarily so they design it in, with that in mind so they you know they know not everyone will have an anatomy background, for example. Um, but anatomy is good to know and has helped with that. Um, biomechanics, surprisingly, <laughs> learning about levers and how to use your body to leverage things and also like how to torque a lot of those words that we were kind of like, wow, we did this in first year <laughs> um, in kin for 151 and for biomechanics. I know the numbers changed now, but uh, for biomechanics in one and two. Um, 
And then neuroanatomy, we're about to have our neuroanatomy course. And if there's the four, the old number was 473, the kin neuroanatomy course. Um, but I, I'm hoping that would be pretty helpful for this course too, because it's a lot of the brain and um, the nerves and the spinal cord. So hopefully that will help as well. Um, but in that sense, that's a lot of the things in OT school is also new, I think things that you wouldn't have the opportunity to learn in undergrad just because it's unique to OT and OT specific, like the theories and the techniques that you would learn and so forth. But Jen, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think like um, it doesn't disadvantage a student if they don't have a kin background, but certain moments I was like, wow, I'm super happy that I did a course, uh, especially maybe like manual muscle testing, range of motion, does more so physical assessments. Um, and I also found that courses I took, I can't remember the names, but they were more disability studies focused, um, just getting more of a sense of uh, the social model of disability or the lived experience of people with disability. Um, that was really helpful coming into it because it connects a lot to um, OT sort of models and, and uh, values. I also, I did a minor in psych and I found there were a few courses specifically that I really drew from when I'm now in my master's. I think it's called um, Psych 314, the health psychology mm -hmm. course, um, as well as some EPSI courses. I did one on autism spectrum disorder and uh, teaching with uh, adults or children with disabilities. And that one has been helpful too. So yeah, I don't think it uh, definitely like makes you a better student, whether you had a kin background or not but it definitely comes in helpful with the sort of physical stuff for sure. Sweet, thank you guys. Um, I think those are the only questions for now. Is there anybody else who has any questions for our presenters or just any questions in general? I think we're good. Um, that was awesome, guys. Uh, thank you guys so much for your time and presentation because I know you guys are really busy with school and um, it's a nice early Saturday morning. So yeah, thank you guys. Um, I'm just gonna send a quick quiz in the chat. So if you guys can feel free to, um, one second, feel free to fill out the quiz. Here you go. But yeah, um, I hope everyone has a good Saturday and um, keep in mind, we have upcoming sessions that are in May as well. So yeah, thank you guys again. No problem. Um, I think we, we put our emails in the resources slide. So if anyone has any questions that come up like down the road, uh, you can feel free to email us and we'll try our best to answer those too. Sweet. Thank you guys. I know I might be emailing you guys too. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. But thank you guys.